I want to thank the Lord for the opportunity we have to be able to study together. There are some very difficult verses for the people of God to understand because they're verses that apply to us and we would rather apply them to somebody else. But in Matthew chapter 24, there is an evil servant. And I want you to follow along in your Bible with me in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 48. Who is this evil servant? Matthew 24, 48 says, And if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. These are really difficult verses. I mean, they're, they're hard verses. And they talk about an individual who is lost. The Lord himself says that this person is cut asunder. He is cut off. Now, this particular statement of Jesus Christ, of this evil servant, is found in the second longest sermon that we have of Jesus Christ that's recorded in Scripture. The longest is the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, 6, 7. But here in Matthew chapter 24, we have the second longest sermon of Christ. And this particular statement about the evil servant is found right in the middle of that particular sermon of Jesus Christ. But there's a little bit of context that we need to have in order to properly understand these words. So let's go back. If we look in Matthew chapter 22, we notice that Jesus is having a discourse with really smart men in Matthew chapter 22. And at the end of the chapter, it says that after they asked him every question that they could, and they could not have any more excuses for their questions, here in Matthew chapter 22 at the end in verse 46, it says, No man was able to answer him a word, neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. So from this point on, from this point on, Nobody has courage to ask Jesus a question anymore. He has answered every question that has been put to him. Every objection has been answered at this point. Now, in chapter 23, Jesus is talking to a multitude. Now, we actually know where Jesus is in Matthew chapter 23. Because he's going to talk, and in Matthew chapter 23, we know that it's two days before the crucifixion. Where is Christ? Christ is in Jerusalem at this point. And in Matthew chapter 23, verse 1, it says that there is a multitude that has gathered together with the disciples. Matthew chapter 23 and verse 1. And then verse 2 says the, some of the words that Jesus spoke here. He says, saying the scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you have to imagine, Jesus is in Jerusalem. He's in the temple. There's a great multitude that's gathered. It's just before a great feast. So there are Hebrews there from all over that have gathered together for the feast. And now Jesus is talking and he calls out the scribes and the Pharisees. And he gets really specific. Let's go down to verse 13. He says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Verse 14. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Wow, this is tough, right? Jesus goes into the temple on a day when there's going to be a lot of people there. They're gathered for the feast. They're giving sacrifices and offerings. And here comes Jesus, and he calls out the leaders of who? The leaders of God's people. And he calls them out. He says, you're, you're hypocrites. You devour the truth. The gospel is being devoured by you, hypocrites. I can imagine that they were not happy with Christ speaking this way to them in such a public and open setting. 
So after giving this strong message that is recorded in Matthew 23 and calling for deep reformation among the people of God, starting with the leaders of God's people, after hearing such a message, in chapter 24, the disciples decide that it's very important for Christ to do something. Go on tourism. Matthew chapter 24. Look, look at verse 1. So Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. Can you imagine? So Jesus just given this great, powerful message, a call to reformation. And the response of the disciples is, let's do some tourism. Let's look at the beautiful buildings in Jerusalem. Now, Jesus is discouraged that they would actually not recognize the power of the message that he's just given. And so when they want to go on tourism, what does he reply? Verse 2, he says, Jesus said unto them, See not all these things. Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Wow. He says, you want to go on tourism? You want to see the beauty of these buildings? Let me tell you something. In a few years, these buildings, they're not going to be here. Why are you spending time on that which is of no profit when I have just given you words of great importance? The disciples were chastised by this. And so in verse 3, it continues. It says that he went away from them. So he's now on the Mount of Olives, and the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Now they recognize we missed it. We missed the message. And so now the disciples come together with Christ to receive instruction. Now, again, we know that this is two days before the Passover because just at the end of it, if you look in chapter 26 and verse 1, it says it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these things, he said unto his disciples, ye know that after two days is the feast of the Passover and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. So we know that this particular message in Matthew 24 is two days before the crucifixion. And so the disciples now ask privately, what shall be the sign of thy coming? What will be the sign, Lord? How will we know that your coming draws nigh? Now, Matthew was a publican. Matthew was educated. He was a tax collector. He knew how to read and write. That was uncommon in those times. So Matthew appears to be one of the scribes among the disciples. He records a lot of Christ's words. And so I can imagine there is Matthew, and he's about to record. And they ask the question, Lord, what will be the sign of the end? And the Lord replies, there will be wars and rumors of wars. There will be, oh, and Matthew is writing. And then Jesus says, but that's not the end. Oh, okay. Then he says, and there will be distress and earthquakes. And, and Matthew is writing all these things. And at the end, each time Jesus says, but, but that's, not, that's not the end. When you go down to verse 42, Jesus makes it clear to them that the sign is a little bit different than what they were thinking. Matthew 24, 42 says, Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. When is the Lord coming? We don't know. Verse 43, But know this, that if the good men of the house had known in, that what, in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. He says, look, the thief does not announce to you. He does not send you a postcard and say, I will rob your house at 2.14 on Tuesday afternoon. He does not do that. So he says here that you do not know that time. Verse 44, therefore be also ready for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. We don't know the day and hour, but we are told to be ready. Verse 5, 45. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find 
so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. So there is a servant in the house and he's waiting, waiting, watching for the return of the master. God's people then are waiting and watching for the return of Jesus Christ. But inside the house, not outside, inside the house, there is another servant. Let's look at verse 48. And if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming. There is a servant. The servant is not outside. This is not talking about unbelievers. This is not talking about the wicked. Verse 48 is talking about a servant. Where is the servant? He's inside the house. He's not outside the house. He's inside the house. He professes to be among the number of those who are waiting for the Lord to come again. And yet, he's called here an evil servant because he says, my Lord delayeth his coming. In Desire of Ages, page 635, commenting on this verse, Desire of Ages 635, it says, the evil servant says in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming. He does not say that Christ will not come. He does not scoff at the idea of his second coming. But in his heart, and by his actions and words, he declares that the Lord's coming is delayed. Does he have the correct doctrine? Yes. Does he believe that Jesus is coming again? Yes. But his words, his actions, his deportment, his dress, his behavior, his recreational entertainments show that he does not believe what he professes. This servant is inside the house. And then he continues to do more. Verse 49, Matthew 24, 49. And he shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and to drink with the drunken. What does he do? To those inside the house who are trying to maintain the watch. To those who are holding to the principles that God has laid down for his servants. What does he do to them? He turns to the very ones who are upholding the truth among the people of God and begins fanatic, extremist. Look, what are you doing? The Lord delays his coming. And when the good servant says, we cannot do this, we cannot engage in this activity, we cannot behave this way, the evil servant works against the good servants, smiting them, and then, while he's in the house, he goes further, inviting the wicked to come and to eat and to drink and to play and to do all the things that they were doing outside. He now is eating and drinking with the drunken, trying to bring inside the house that which the Lord determined should never be in his home. That's why these verses are uncomfortable for us. Because we would like to apply this to somebody else. But God says that one of the signs of his coming is that among his people are those who profess to be among them and yet are attempting to bring into his house that which should never be there. Going back to the commentary in Desire of Ages, it says about the evil servant, page 635, he banishes from the minds of others the conviction that the Lord is coming quickly. His influence leads men to presumptuous, careless delay. They are confirmed in their worldliness and stupor. Earthly passions, corrupt thoughts take possession of the mind. He smites his fellow servants, accusing and condemning those who are faithful to their master. The evil servant eats and drinks with the drunken, unites with the world in pleasure-seeking. He mingles with the world. 
Like grows with like in transgression. It is a fearful assimilation. With the world, he is taken in its snare. Going back then to Matthew chapter 24, what is the result? The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him and in an hour that he is not aware of. Have God's people forgotten that he is coming soon? Has Adventist simply become a name for us and not a way of life? Is it simply a profession of our faith or is it an expression of who we are? My grandfather was a minister in a communist country and uh, they were persecuted for their faith. Many of them were in prison for their faith. And yet I remember growing up that my grandfather never said a prayer that did not include the phrase, Lord, come quickly. Every prayer, I'm talking even like prayers for food. (laughs) He used to pray for Jesus to come quickly. We've stopped praying for Jesus to come quickly. Now we want the Lord to delay his coming. And our profession is no longer our expression of faith. This cannot be among those who would receive the good reward. Because these servants, evil servants, that seek to give the impression that the Lord delays his coming, who even go so far as to try and bring within the house of God those things which should never be found there, they do great disservice to the truth. In Testimonies for the Church, volume 3, page 255, We have these words in the spirit of prophecy. Testimonies for the Church, volume 3, page 255. Faith in the soon coming of Christ is waning. My Lord delayeth his coming is not only said in the heart, but expressed in words and most decidedly in works. Stupidity. It's not my word. It's not my word. It's, It's recorded there. Stupidity. In this watching time is sealing the senses of God's people as to the signs of the times. The terrible iniquity which abounds calls for the greatest diligence and for the living testimony to keep sin out of the church. Faith has been decreasing to a fearful degree and it is only by exercise that it can be increased. Stupidity? the activities that we are engaging in, the so-called recreation, the social media that we consume could fitly be described as stupidity. And yet, God's people seem benumbed to this. In Luke 6, 46, Jesus says, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? What is the purpose of your beautiful hymns that you sing on Sabbath when I saw your Facebook feed and saw the things that you like? And now you will give a profession of faith? Among God's people, we must understand that our expressions speak more loudly than our professions. And our actions are determining whether or not our message will be heard with a clear sound. The essential verse of scripture in John 3.16 cannot be read in isolation. In John 3, 16, it says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But the message does not end there. Going down in verse 19, 
It says this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Verse 21, but he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Now is our opportunity to make a decision. Which kind of servant am I? All of us gathered here today are in the house. Thank God. Thank God that we are in the house. Servants in the house. The decision is not whether or not we are servants, but what kind of servants we will be. Are we waiting anxiously for the coming of the Lord? Are we preparing ourselves to be the people of God? Or are we saying with our expressions, the Lord delays his coming? I hope and pray that we will be that servant that will receive the reward. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 21 and 22 says, Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? The choice is ours, and I hope and pray that we will make the one that will see us together in the clouds of glory. Amen.